So this morning, I've got the, pr- the privilege to share uh, with the word of the Lord with you. Just want to acknowledge Dr. Ben and Sonia, they, uh, and, 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 and thank God for them, and know them, know their, their, their lives. We've, we've seen their lives as a, as a, as a, as you would watch a movie, one watches their lives, and we are thankful for the way in which they live their lives to the full, and that it strengthens the body. All right, children's church, you are welcome to leave now, and uh, may you also have a blessed time. We bless you with fruitfulness in, in whatever you do. Isn't it a pleasure, isn't it a privilege that our children can sit under the word? Amen. Amen. It, is, it is a privilege as a family to be locked into a house, to be part of a house, and not be, to be, to be on isolated. This, in this day, to be isolated is a very dangerous place to be. But to come here and to have the privilege to sit here week after week and be strengthened by grace. And, and this is a privilege that we have. Now, uh, Dr. Ben has taught us, uh, you look for that golden line in the beginning of the session. And the first song and the first things that um, Sibu said was already confirming the word that the Lord want to bring. Because I've been on, on, uh, I've been on a page th- since the beginning of the year of, of, um, uh, of sonship. So I've been talking about sonship. Whenever we go to any of these missions, just consistently be speaking about sonship. And this morning I thought, Yo, okay, this is, this, this is I've, I've really tested and tested my heart. And I still feel this is what God wants me to speak about, is sonship. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just call it the new wine scheme. So, and I'm gonna, just going to flow a little bit this morning. Not so be strict to, to my notes and everything. So to make sure to say what I'm supposed to say. And um, because there's a lot of doctrine that was shared here. Now, important is that Jesus, in his ministry, he took three, three and a half years in teaching his disciples. Now, you must remember, those disciples were taught at the, the, the Jewish school. They knew the Torah when they were 12 years old. They were taught by the Lord. And still, Jesus taught them. You know, they were taught in the doctrine. But Jesus then taught them in the kingdom, in the kingdom principles. He, he laid out what the shadow of the Old Testament was giving, he was laying it out in, from a New Testament perspective. And still, after three and a half years, Philip asked him right at the end. Now, I can, I can just think to myself, I'm a pastor, and somebody asks me something like this, which showed Philip didn't believe him, in him. Show us the Father. I mean, Jesus has been speaking on a daily basis by him and the Father, and he showed the signs of the Father, and Philip asked him, show us the Father. You can just imagine, fortunately, uh, Jesus was Jesus, and he didn't get despondent with sons. And then the next one was um, Thomas, who, who, who started questioning the, the, the resurrection life. Although he was, he was, he was teaching all the, in the resurrection life, and Jesus said, I'm the resurrection, the life. Thomas didn't even show up. He stopped attending. It's, it, it's, it was, it's, it's, like, it's like a normal church. People sometimes just stop attending <laughs> for no particular reason. And then he, he questioned. He questioned whether he's alive. And he was actually arrogant by saying, well, you guys that say he's alive, I want to push my fingers into that hole. You know, that was quite, it's a, he, and he's still called an apostle. So that was Thomas. Peter, just point blank, we, we heard last week that it, was, that it was Simon, but he denied Jesus. <laughs> In front of a slave girl, not even in front of a soldier or whatever, a slave girl. He said, no, I don't know this guy from a bar of soap. I know, no, I don't know who he is. I don't know. I'm just sitting here at the fire. <laughs> and this was Peter. And the, 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 Peter also had, the, they, 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 they went back to their old ways. They went back to, I'm going to go fishing. And they, you, you, you wouldn't say that after all these three years of doctrine, that they received, of the life that, of Jesus that was painted in front of them and in, in, in that they could follow, that these disciples were actually disciples of Jesus. So now any pastor that sits here this morning, I hope you feel better. Because sometimes you feel really like a, a failure when you think after all these years, you can't believe what people do. But then something happens. Jesus says to them, he teaches them of his resurrection. He goes and he says, in the, for 40 days, he taught them the principles of the kingdom. So he continued in in teaching them the principles of the kingdom. And then Jesus left, and they had to wait. And 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus, 
they were in the upper room, about 120 of them, and the Holy Spirit, they were all baptized in the Holy Spirit. And we know that's the Pentecost, Pentecostal experience. And remember, important, we go back and we consistently, because every feast is taken up in the greater, until it's eventually to- taken up in the tabernacles. Tabernacles is the culmination of all feasts. But ve- ve- what, is, what is very important about the feast, we go back and we celebrate the feast. So Pentecost was that feast that everybody in his personal life and every church must experience. Now, uh, Paul says an uh, important thing to the Galatians. He says, have you received the, 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 the spirit through the works of the flesh or the works of the law, the law, or through the preaching? So as we sit here week after week and we sit under the doctrine, the Holy Spirit, the doctrine contains the Holy Spirit. And we, dependent on our posture, can be baptized in the Holy Spirit consistently. So have, have you ever been in somebody's presence, and when they leave you, you just, believe, you just experience, you've just been filled with the Holy Spirit. You just feel filled. You're just satisfied. And we can have that in any experience. This, the breaking of the bread this morning. You can have the breaking of the bread daily. And in the experience of the breaking of the bread, but just after that, you just say, say yeah, but I'm filled. I'm part of the body. I'm, I'm the, and, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. In our worship this morning, we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Spirit. But what, the point I want to come to is after they've been filled with the Holy Spirit, you all of a sudden see all the things that pastors preach about happened automatically. They were one accord. They were continuing. It wasn't something you have to tell them to do. Continuing an apostles' doctrines, breaking of bread, fellowship, prayers. They were breaking bread from house to house. They were givers. You didn't need to, take, to receive an offering. They were givers. There was something about the people of God. There was an excitement which nobody taught them to be excited, but it was in them. And that excitement came from the, the inward man. Streams of living water will flow, flow from your inner, innermost being. The point is they had community life. They had the spirit of community. And this morning, I want to declare this. I remembered Apostle John Alley when he was here. He declared the spirit of community over us. And I want to this morning say again, in the name of Jesus Christ, I release the spirit of community. Receive it by faith. And receive the spirit of discernment. Of, 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 of um, uh, not discernment, uh, discernment as well. Understanding. Of understanding. And, the spirit, and, and, and we receive this in meekness. To understand what is God's plan with a corporate body. To understand where God is going with us. I think we'll miss it if we are individualistically minded in this season. We need to be corporately minded. And, and, and to understand where God is going with us. So there's a spirit of community. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a community among us that we love one another. That we grow as we commune with one another. We are supposed to grow. We are supposed to, where the word, where the word falls, uh, that, that people will need to grow. People need to change. Families uh, need to change. And, um, you know, there's, there's, there's counselors. You, you find there's a lot of people make a living from counseling. And that's maybe not bad, and I, I think there's a place for it. But I want to say to you, if people come under the word of the Lord, they will not need a lot of counseling. Because there's a seed in the word of the Lord. There's a, there's a spirit in the word of the Lord. And if we come daily, if we come weekly, and we are, we are, we are rubbing, we are, the wine is in the cluster. If the cluster is, if we are in the cluster, uh, the, and, and we enjoy the new wine, the new wine, the, the water that has become wine, then we will not be in such a need. We'll be, like James says, um, satisfied, fulfilled, in lack of nothing. So, so this is church life. And then in what, one of the things somebody said last night, he said, after the great plague, there was the renaissance. And I want to say after COVID, there's a renaissance. There's really a growth. We will see it in the world. I said it to, to an attorney this week. I said to her, I said to you, you must know one thing. There's definitely a boom coming. We're preparing ourselves for a boom. Um, and, 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 and very important, God's people must not look at the political situation and the news and everything. Your yeah, focus must be, what did the Lord say? What is my day job? What am I supposed to do? Where, where, what must I do? Not what they are doing. God will deal with what they are doing. But what must I do? 
and, and focus on that and find my joy in what, what I must do and prepare myself for what God is preparing me to walk into. I really believe there's, there's, uh, it's, it's the, the, the times and the seasons we are in is, is I'm preparing myself for 20 years, for a 20-year p- period in terms of business, in terms of ministry. And I'm very happy if everything, if we just continue as we are, um, because after the plague, the renaissance will come. After the COVID, a lot of things have changed. There's a lot of movements. There's a lot of, there's a change of God that has happened after COVID. There's a change of authority in places. There are, there's, there's, there's a, as, as I say, a change of God. And God's people can be on guard now. God's people can, can, can really step into the gaps that are left, even in the church, in the business world, in every sphere of life. And we are called to, to walk into it, to step up to the mark, to, to be a son that is reaping in the time of harvest, not to be lazy, to, to, really, to really get into this what God has for us now. It's a, gr- a time of great opportunity. This is a time of great blessing for all of us. Once again, I say, do not quote the econom- economic s- situation. Do not quote BEE. Do not quote um, WEE. White economic empowerment. Don't think, quote anything. Don't use anything as an excuse. Because there's only two kinds of people. Those who found a way and those who found an excuse. Uh, but one very important is the building process is sometimes slow. So when God says something, it sometimes we, we, we go to a summit, for instance. Or we go to a service and there's a prophet. Or, or we receive a word from the Lord. And, and if, you, if, you, if we remind ourselves, since the beginning of the year, God, Dr. Ben is consistently saying, he's consistently being, in fact, every week he's been prophesying about the glory that God is about to, to release. There's a glory of God that's being released. He's been saying it every week. He's been telling it, he's been prophesying it. And many times we have such as Christians and have such a short, it's either today, tomorrow, or next week. And if it doesn't happen, then it's not true. Then we forget about it and we go fishing. But God works in processes. So many times God would have said something in 2013. And he's busy with the fulfillment of what he prophesied. And then we turn around and we say, yeah, but God said he will destroy Nineveh. And he didn't do it. So was it really the word of the Lord? Many, many things that he does in our lives, we get despondent. And we go and sit still. But God is busy with the process. And immediately when he says it, that process is, is, is activated. Angels are dispatched to, to, to fulfill those processes in our lives. And many times we do not fully understand what God is busy with. We think something will happen this week. Jesus is coming tomorrow. And we have this hasty uh, way of thinking. But if you take, for instance, Reformation, the young people, how, uh, how many years were, were there Reformation? Can anybody tell me more or less how many years? Luther, Martin Luther. 500 years. And the work of Martin Luther is still taking place on earth. It's still being rolled out. Wesley, um, all, all the great uh, John G. Lake. Many, uh, I, once a week in my life, somebody quotes something of John G. Lake. He was here 120 years ago. But the works of John G. Lake can still be seen. But all of, the, all of that is taken up into the new. So now we are in the apostolic season. By the apostolic season, we must give it a chance. We're in the shallow waters. We're in the beginning steps of the apostolic season. The end game will be the whole world will be in the apostolic. Not the whole church, the whole world. Apostolic. Apostolic doesn't mean we're all aposto- apostles. It's a season. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a movement. It's an it's a establishment. Uh, the apostolic is bringing the body to until the place of the fullness that Lida spoke of earlier this morning. Uh, the apostolic is a means to an end. It is what God is doing in the earth. This could take three, four, five hundred years. So therefore, we need to be faithful in what God is doing in our generation in order for the next generation to walk into the fullness of what they mustn't start at scratch. You find believers that are still now coming to the realization they must be baptized in water, the baptize of belie- baptism of believers. Now, the baptism of the, the, re, the release of, of that move of God was about 400 years ago, the Anabaptists. But some, some believers only realize now they must be baptized. So that knowledge is still being unfolded in the church. The, the laying on of hands, the healing uh, movements and, and everything. 
And the one thing that God, the, the next generation, the next move of God always carries a greater glory than the previous. Because Haggai prophesied it. He said, the future glory of this house will be greater than the former. So let's believe that, that the future glory of this house will be greater than the former. And uh, from a prophetic point of view, I see a lot of things that God's going to do. I, I spoke, to, spoke to Lida about it. I see things. I see our households of faith will get a new dimension and a new, we're going to get a new view of a household of faith. Because there's, there's a lot of dynamics in terms of evangelism in going, going and planting a household of faith. And by the way, you don't need a sound system and a drum set for a household of faith to be a household of faith. You need a father. So fathers, this is what Dr. Ben said in the beginning of the year. Fathers are important. Fathers must be raised up in this season. We must father fathers. And I believe there's a great anointing on this house. Um, I don't say everybody will father fathers, but there are young people sitting here. I'm prophesying now. There are young people sitting here. I can, I can actually name you, and you're ready in the posture of a father. You have nothing holding you back to go and father fathers. You can become a father. And, and because if we can raise up fathers, and fathers can plant households of faith, and it doesn't need to be big. Don't think it must be 400, 500. I don't have a problem. Sometimes people think that it, when it's a big church, there's an apostle. A pastor will probably have the biggest church. A, a teacher where there's a teaching anointing, we'll have big churches. So I have no problem with any of those things. But the, 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 the concept that I just want to explain is that fathers, you may have a father, you may have an apostolic father of preaching to 80 people or 70 people. You, f you find that. And it's many times because God just wants an incubator that he can release the word to, and, and that house is being called with the apostle. So very important, everybody is being called with Dr. Ben. When he goes on an international mission or we go on a national mission, you must know you are called with us. And the principle that King David laid down was those who watch the goods will get the same reward as those who have gone to the mission. So households of faith, for instance, and I want to come back to that. I believe there's a new concept, there's a new, de there's a new definition that we will see. Now, once again, now everybody thinks God's going to reveal it this week. Over the next years we will get a better understanding of the things that we walk in. Uh, a better concept of city church. We will see a better concept of city church unfolding and how the city church works. How does it work with an overseer of a city or an overseer of, of a work? And that, that all those people will actually need to come and listen to the apostle when he brings the word. And then the fathers can work that, that seed into the lives of the people. That's how you're building a one people. So there's many things that we have an understanding of, but we need to get a better understanding. So I want you to relax and just know that you, we must be productive. We must have productive lives. Nobody must be unemployed in terms of physical or natural or spiritual. People must be productive in the kingdom. And, but we must also relax in terms of let's get into the process, the times and the seasons that God is busy working with. Now, God may do something. Uh, for instance, the beginning of this year, I, I knew in my heart, whatever is going to be brought in this first year after COVID will be very important. It, because how will God, if, uh, if you logically think of it, God will lay down the path that we need to walk into over the next couple of years. He will tell us what will happen. Now, once again, we expect it will happen next week. But it will unfold over the next couple of years. We must be faithful. We must receive that and, and, and to receive that by faith and say, Lord, yes, come and have your way. Lord, come and do what you want to do. Come and do, come and raise the people up. As you said, you, you, you're going to raise up people. Um, many times when we plant a, 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 a table, you know, we, we almost stand back and see what will, what will be the end of this table, where it will grow to. Some, some, some of them grows quickly and then slow down. Others grow, start slowly. Sometimes it just takes the faithfulness of one person that constantly go and have the table until the Lord add it. You know, uh, when we were in Plate earlier this year, Prophet Sean Blicknote told us, he said for, I think, seven years, there were seven people in their household. Now, he's a prophet. He's been called the prophet to the nation, to the nations, but he had seven people in his house. So, to understand what God is busy doing, we must not look with a fleshly eye. 
We must not look from a, from, from a, from a f- physical dimension, but we look from the spirit because God is at work. God is working with and, and he's working on and he's working very widely. And so times and the, the seasons and times, we, uh, we, must, we must also be delivered from boredom, from restlessness, and from haste. Those three things are dangerous things. You know, when you come to a point, you say, Lord, but you said certain things concerning my life. Why hasn't it been materialized? You know why? Most of the times, because it is not the time for that thing. Because things follow suit. They follow in the process. You can't have... The, you order the material of the roof while you're still busy laying the foundations. So everything in its place, everything in its time. I believe if we're faithful, if we show up like you are, you all are here this morning, that we're at the right place. And God can st- start working in our lives. He can bring his word into our lives. We can get assurance. We can get conviction of, of things that we must cut off, that we must let go of. And we can, we can start walking in the things which God has called us to walk into. So I'm going to speak about, I'm going to continue just in terms of the new wine scheme. Now, just, there's just an important scripture that I want to give you. If Isaiah 3 verse 10, I just want to bless you. You know, there's sometimes we, we are so running around and uncertain and, you know, we have crises. God wants, to let, God wants us to, and you must hear the word of the Lord this morning. God wants us to come out of crisis mentality. The crisis. And God wants us to rule and reign and, and, and trust him to work the outcome. Many times when we are in crisis, it's because we do not believe that God will work the outcome. Now, Psalm 18 says, if you are faithful, God is faithful. He will show him faithful. So faithfulness is a requirement for God to come through in the crisis. Psalm 18 says it. So if we're faithful, God is faithful. I see it. People that are faithful, you see God is faithful towards them. Um, but so, so it's important to, that, we are, that, we, that we stay and remain faithful. If we are unfaithful, there's consequences to unfaithfulness. Many times it, it's just we see the positive side, but there's a negative side to being unfaithful, to not be obedient. There's a negative side to that, that, that we do not see the outcome as we are supposed to see the outcome. But God is faithful to, 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 um, to those who are faithful. Therefore, we need to sit here to understand what it means to be faithful. And committed. So, but uh, I want to encourage you this morning. I, I got this scripture this week, and I really believe this is for the church. Tell the righteous it will be well with them. Uh, it's Isaiah 3 verse 10. For they will enjoy the fruit of their deeds. I want to tell you this morning, it will be well with you. It will be, you will enjoy the fruit of your deeds. Don't look around. Just look where God has pointed you. Just be busy with that. Just just walk in that. And the, 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 God, the Lord says, they say, we will enjoy, not we will have, we will enjoy the fruits of their deeds. B- b- ma- the mere fact that you are bringing your, your children to church to, to, to expose them to the word of the Lord means it, it will have an effect on their lives. We will see that we will enjoy the fruits. So in Matthew 9, verse 14, then the disciples of, I'm going to read from verse 14 to 17. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, why do we, we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, so they've asked the question. The disciples of John wants to know, the Pharisees' disciples fast, his disciples fast. They're fasting, but these disciples of Jesus do not fast. And then Jesus, so Jesus answers them. He says, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and the tear is made worse. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break. The wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. So this whole thing about wineskins is not something new. So John the Baptist and his disciples were from the old covenant. And the Pharisees came from an old order. So what Jesus just explains to them, yeah, is that is the old. It's an old wineskin, and it's an old wine that, that were coming. And they, therefore he says, I'm the bridegroom. So immediately he connects it to a, a wedding. 
and he says, I'm the bridegroom, and therefore this is a new season, and this is a, time, this is a new wineskin, and this is new wine. Now the question is, what is this wineskin? Now, if we le- read in Psalm 127, verse 1 to 5, he says, Unlo- Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in va- vain who built it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the breads of sorrow. He doesn't say we mustn't do this. He says, if you do this in order to achieve something, he says, that's in vain. For so he gives his beloved sleep. So in other words, he, he, in, the, in, the, in some of the translations, he says, he gives all of that wh- which you need to his beloved in their sleep. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Uh, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children, sons are a heritage from the Lord. So children are a heritage. Whether they're spiritual or whether they're natural, children are a heritage. Let's thank the Lord for all the babies. The fruit of the... I, yeah. I speak babies, many children to you. Don't just have four, have many babies. Be fruitful. I speak it to have no, no unfruitful womb in this house. No unfruitful womb. Speak, speak fruitfulness over everybody. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gates. So when you have children, when you have sons, they contend with the enemies in the gates. Same in the church, the same in the household. If you work with sons, if you work with members, there's nobody in the gate. But you, if you build with sons, you have somebody that contend with the enemies in the gate, that, that, that protects the house. So that word build is the word, word bana, to build. Um, to obtain children, to make repair. So that's banal. It's coming from the word ben. And the word house is the word bayith. It's probably from abbreviated house. The greatest variation of application, especially a family, a, a daughter. Um, so, so that word comes from the same base word. And then the word son or children in that scripture comes from the word ben, which is a son, as a builder of the family. So God says your family a house. Unless the Lord families a house, you, you, you work in vain. Even if you work hard, if, and if you work from the morning to the evening, like Babylon that builds with bricks, even if you work from early in the morning, get up early in the morning till late, if you don't work with sons, you are building in vain. Why is it that we must work with sons? And this connects now with the, with the word that we had the, the last couple of months. Because sons can receive the inheritance. Sons can receive the inheritance. A slave can't. A slave will just receive gifts, but a son will receive the inheritance. And God has an inheritance that he wants to bless his church with, but we need to walk in the inheritance. John 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. This was in the beginning, John 1 verse 1, and I, I'm, 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 I'm showing you something. Um, now, who is the word? The Revelation 9 11. 1911, now I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse and you sat on him was called faithful and true. And in right sense to this, he judges and makes war. His eyes, were, now we can unpack this, this is so powerful. His eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. It's the overcoming of, of, of Christ. It's the overcoming of the body. It's ruling in the midst of your enemies. All those crowns, um, he had a name written that no one knew except himself. Name is his nature which is the nature that the body of Christ also receives. He was clothed with a rope dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So Jesus, or Christ, and and God was together from the beginning. So very important. So you'll see the scriptures that unfold now. So the Father and the Son were from the beginning um, together, and they were one. Now 1 John 2, verse 22 to 24 who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. See this? The one that denies the Father and the Son. Now, very important, what God has in his relationship with his Son, Jesus Christ, that same relationship he's giving to his church. So we, we, do, not have, we, not, we do not walk with one another in a foreign way to what God has laid down as a foundation in terms of relationships. 
Now, I want to get down to, to, you know, if I ask the question this morning, what is the true kingdom culture? Or what, are, what do I, what is, what is the true apostolic spirit? Many people will see different things. Some people will say signs, wonders, and miracles, and others will say ruling and reigning, uh, dominion and authority. But really, the essence of the kingdom, if you, if, you, if you cut down to the essence, is love. It is relationships. Those things are much more important. Those things need to be in place. That our relationship, that there's trust and faithfulness, like in the Son of God. That there's trust for one another. That there's, they're like this bunch of the, the disciples, apostles, that they were, they were fighting who's the biggest. Until they went to the spirit of community where the baptism of the Holy Spirit happened to them. And then, then they came to a point of one, um, is, is like Romans 12 says, you put one uh, b- before the other. You, you honor one another. Um, you, you submit to one another. So whoever denies the son does not have the father either. You acknowledge the son has the father also. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. So he says, anything outside of the Father and the Son is the Antichrist. It's the spirit of Antichrist. In other words, Antichrist is anti the anointing. So if you want to see anything formed, in, the, in if, if you want to receive anything, if you want to come into the lineage, if you want to come into the inheritance, you need that the ingredients that is needed is Father and Son. So the point I want to make is the wineskin of the New Testament, Testament, not the wineskin of the Reformation or the wineskin of the Apostolic, but the wineskin of the New Testament is Father and Son. This is important. This is not, so in other words, when we come to Pentecost, then would the Pentecost say, no, the Pentecost is the, is the new wineskin. And we come to the healing or the charismatic, the charismatic say, no, the charismatic is the, is the wineskin. No. From the beginning, for 2,000 years, the new wineskin, or, or for all, forever, the new wineskin is the wineskin of father and son. This is how God ultimately builds his nation. How gods have tribes and have tongues and have, have, have a nation, have a house. God's house consists, the building blocks, the vehicle, the container is, is father and son. I believe that inheritance is activated in father and son. Now, if somebody says, but I don't believe in fathers and sons, am I still saved? Of course you are saved. This is not a law. This is a blessing. This is a grace. This is something you are invited to walk in. It's not legalistic. This is not something we can force onto people. You know, some people, their experience of a father, spiritual father, is to get one WhatsApp a year from the spiritual father. And if it's good for them, that's good. We mustn't judge them. If, 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 if they require more. So we have different exposure and different demands and different hunger in our hearts towards towards the father-son wine scheme. But I just want to, what I want to say this morning is the father wine scheme is a blessing. It is not legalistic. It is not enforced on people. Although in the beginning shoes of this house and the, the city church here, that we, we, that we were very forceful about it and we spoke a lot about it. And, but this is the ultimate wine scheme. This is the, it will, it's, a, it's, it's, it's always there. It will always be the father and son because human, every human being have a need to be in a father-son relationship. Every father, um, every, any father first needs to become a son. You need to walk in that. And sonship is one of the greatest things. In fact, the 120, Psalm 127 says it's a blessing from the Lord to, to walk in fathers and sons. So we must also not have a legalistic point of view. We must also not have a viewpoint of a father it's a, it's a very strong leader, it's a strong man, it's the big man, like in Africa, it's the big man, it's a chief. We must have a different view of a father. A father is somebody that carries grace. It may not always be the biggest church, he may not drive the smartest car, although that doesn't exclude him. He may not be the smartest business person. A father could be a father, you know, it can be any father, but God raises up fathers. And I want people to to not feel um, inferior, to know that God has probably called you as a father, although you disqualify yourself. 
because we need fathers. We need fathers in this season. That's a vehicle. That's a container. Not a church organization. Not we formed this new NPC, now we're a church. Or we bought a building, now we're a church. It's nice to have a building. And it's nice to have an NPC. But you can, and, and uh, NPC is a non-profit company. You can have whatever you want to in order to help you. But the vehicle, the ultimate vehicle that, that, that households are based on, that city churches are based on, that the body of Christ is based on, is the wine skin, the new wine skin of fathers and sons to receive the wine, in order to receive the wine. This is so important that this principle, that we understand this principle, because this forms the basis of church. Church, well, is, we, are, we are far, far, far past a member preacher mentality. We have walked in fathers and sons. And you may father somebody. Joseph said, I'm a father to the Pharaoh. And I promise you, Pharaoh never went to Joseph's church. So the question is, who are we fathering? And we don't need to call. And, and once again, we are, we are a, a very, very serious um, a mixture of father and son. The way we, many people handle it differently over the world. Not everybody calls the spiritual father Partinus. In plate, my nickname is Partinus. <laughs> the business people now calls me Partinus. <laughs> but, but that doesn't, that's not to say I'm everybody's father. The, the fact is, I'm fathering some people who will never call me father. I mean, they, it's just not in their vocabulary. But I fulfill the function of father to them. And so, you, you can be the, the, the person working at you. If you are the Melchizedek in their lives, pr- providing bread and wine, then you probably the father God has appointed. We must not over, inf- over complicate this matter. It mustn't be a over... Uh, we, must not inten- we must not complicate it so much that it becomes so, so an issue. We must just naturally, organically flow into sonship relationships. So the New Testament, if the New Testament, the wineskin of the New Testament, the, new wi- the, the wineskin is fathers and sons. It means G- Jesus will pour the new wine into the wineskin. So, so the wineskin is the father and son relationship. And everything that happens then in that, that's the new wine that God pours into. Now, new wine is a good thing. If one of the first miracles that Jesus did in Cana, by the way, he did his second miracle in Cana as well in John, was, was he raised a son in Cana. The, it, was the, it was the wine, the water, that he turned into wine. And when the, the master of the ceremony drank the water that has become wine, he called Jesus. He called the bridegroom. He wanted to speak to Jesus. So when our wine schemes, our father and son wine schemes, are filled with a new wine, the people will start calling the bridegroom. Say, I need some bride, bridegroom in my life. I've got a need for Jesus. That's why these relationships must not, this is so important what I'm going to say now. Our father-son relationships must not be fake. It must not be mechanical. It must not be um, it must not be legalistic. It must be natural. It must be a flow. It must be that even the world embraces that. You may have people at your, your, your business. You may have people at work or in a group that you are fathering. When you go to them in humility, say to the Lord, Lord, I operate in the spirit of Father today. I operate in the spirit of father. You, be, you can be a father to your community, but the, our country needs fathers. If there's fathers in place, we had a situation this week which Gareth and I dealt with where the guy he was very angry and, um, and he didn't have an outlet for his anger. And, and then he started, uh, um, uh, um, being, uh, uh, he started vandalizing. So I said, no, we just want to see him. And I talked, and just like this, I, w- I was getting to the guy's heart. Burst out in tears, said, listen, t- um, Mr. Delport. He calls Gareth Gareth, but he calls me Mr. Delport. <laughs> that's, just, that's just a side note. But um, he said to me, Mr. Delport, I was so angry. But I said to him, listen, you next time, you can't be, if you're so angry, uh, you must, there's a different way. You're going to speak. You, must, you, you, can't, you can't become violent in public. 
The fact is that guy, when he received the spirit of father, all violence disappeared. So the question I ask you, who's, who is fathering the people out there that, that does a lot of iniquity, that does a lot of, have, walk in a lot of lawlessness? See, the world needs fathers. The world needs fathers. And it's not just some pastors of churches that are fathers. It, it is a natural, organic development in relationships, but it's about relationships. And what is my ultimate, when I work with homeless people, the ultimate governing thing between us is love. I acknowledge you for who you are. I acknowledge you, the fact that you coming from a, from, you live in a shack or under carton boxes, and I do not live like that, I still love you, and I value you as a person. I, I want to hear what you are saying, and I'm prepared to sit down to, with you, and I want to listen to you, and I want to talk to you, because you have something important to say. Then they experience a real father-son relationship. If, we are, if, we, if they can't come to us, if they don't have our cell phone numbers, I've, you know, I did a very bold experiment. I took 10 <laughs> homeless people, and I gave them jackets with my telephone number on. I said, anybody can phone me. I had, in, and I said to, they were patrollers, and we, we, we did this. And in, in a year's time, I had one phone call from the public who complained about the guy, the one guy. <laughs> and when I had his side of the story, I thought he dealt with a Jezebel. That, that woman was a Jezebel. I, I, could, I, I could understand his side of the story. So, so they mu- we must be accessible. That somebody must be able to get to us, to get through to us on the telephone line. And say, listen, I'm now in need. And this is for all of us. I tell you, I, I'm going gonna, gonna to let the monkey out of the sleeve. I, I say to Lira many times, I'm, I'm, I, want, I want to stay on the sideline when nobody knows. I want to just pastor a church. But it can be 10 people, 12 people. I see them on a Thursday evening. Why? Be, not because I want to build another. It's because I want to father I want to be able to be there, not even to, to, just to be there, to be Christ. So this is a practical thing. Now, if we start walking in these things, now I love the church. I love the church of God. And when I say I love the church, I don't think organizing people coming on a Sunday and so forth. I just love people. Love people to gather people, whether it's under a tree, whatever, and start bringing the word of God. Start because the once the word is brought, the, he sends his word to, to rescue them out of their pits and to heal them. So once you speak the word, those things happen. Amen. So that's why it's so important to not walk in the Antichrist. What is the Antichrist? The, the structures of the previous, of the ways in which church was in many ways organized was Antichrist. Because it was anti the heart of God. Anti how God wants to reach people. Disempowering people. The Nicolaites lording over the people. That's Antichrist. The real spirit of Christ is to meet everybody. Remember, God so loves the world. He still loves the world. He has not condemned the world. The world is not our enemy. He loves the world. He sent his son that he gave, his only begotten son. What he could give, he gave. So he says, therefore, let that abide in you, which you heard from the beginning. If, if, if what you have heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. I, I want to say to the young people, you may see something at school. And if you really allow God to deal with your heart, you'll be able to pray a prayer that will heal somebody's life. I've experienced it, how I prayed prayers. And, and, and just from a broken posture and how that prayer has gone and hit heaven, hit a six. God caught the ball and he threw it back and answered it immediately. Our God saved people, our God rescued people with a heart that really has compassion. Not, not empathy, but compassion. This is what we will need in South Africa. We will need to be all fathers. We will need to take up that mantle. You know, Elisha went beyond the Jordan. The prophet sons, they were religious. They were prophesying. You know, they were prophesying number plates, <laughs> cell phone numbers. They were prophesying, prophesying, prophesying. But Elisha actually did something. He went beyond the Jordan with Elijah 
and he saw his light. So the same with the disciples. The disciples saw him. This is very clear in scripture. They saw him ascend and then they waited for him. And they received the Holy Spirit. Without the Spirit, we are dry. Without the Spirit, we will not be able to administrate this body because the body is a multifaceted body of Christ. It's not as simple as just running a church. It's not as simple as, that's why when we form tables, I stand back and I watch, where is this table going to? Is this going to have a regional impact? Is this just going to have a local impact? Or is this going to die? You never know. It depends on faithfulness. It depends on anointing. It depends on grace. Grace and anointing, by the way, is actually the same thing. So, but Elisha went beyond. And this is what I believe is required of sons. And I'll come to this now. That, that, that sons need to go start going beyond. And what I saw after COVID, my question is many fathers. How many sons are still pursuing fathers? Because if you do not pursue a father, let's say a father is going well with him. He's a strong leader and he, he does well and he, uh, he's rich and he's anointed. Then everybody wants to follow him. Why? Because what they can receive. It's a selfish thing. But let's say all of that ch ch changes around. My question is, like I've heard somebody said the other day to Dr. Ben, he said to him, but Doc, where are you? You know, he's still here. We all have access to him, you, but it changed. <laughs> you actually need to take the responsibility. You need to pursue in a wise way. Whether it means come and sit here on a Sunday, or, I don't know. It's, there's, there's different ways to engage. But if the heart is right, engagement will not be difficult. It will be there. You can never say it's unaccessible. Unac okay. So now Malachi 4 verse 5 to 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Now you've heard this many times. The curse is released from real engagement of fathers and sons. The twistedness or the turned awayness of fathers. Now that guy in the squatter camp, he's cursed. He will agree with me. <laughs> I've seen many of, I mean, if, if you have not even toilet facilities, this is a curse. You are cold in winter, your friends burn to death, that's a curse. You don't, you don't have something to eat. Nobody cares, you die, no funeral, whatever, that's a curse. Now, how will we turn around the curse on those sons' lives? Is by turning our hearts to them, so that their hearts can turn to us, that there's relationship. Then the name that we carry, which we saw on the white horse, is protecting them. Then we bring a protection. Then we bring a protection over whoever, that could be somebody at school, could be somebody in need, Whatever, a turned heart. He says, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. The curse is striking. But to turn the curse around, you need fathers and sons. That grace of fathers and sons. The world needs the body of Christ. The way they're going to receive us is through grace. Our grace for you. We all need grace. Grace is an enablement. When, I, when we were at the, um, the, the Shiloh breakaway last weekend, I was blessed by the graces that were there, and I ate from the graces. Like my, the, my one worker said to me, I steal from them. So I stole them. If, if, whatever they have, I don't care, any attribute. If it's like Pastor Charles is in shape, I steal that. <laughs> or I steal somebody that is organized, or somebody that plans well, or somebody that has a revelation from Scripture. I steal all of that. I take it for me, because I, we live by grace. We built by grace. This is how the house is built. So we need, we need that, those relationships. We need this house relationship. Don't come here because you must tell Pastor Charles. Come here because you say, I can't afford to miss out on what God has for me on this Sunday. There's a word that's going to flow. God's going to probably speak to me. God's going to give me direction. God's going to give me energy. God's going to show me what to do. I remember, um, I think it was last week. At the, 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 the breakaway, when I was there, somebody just said, I'm not, I'm not going to refer to the name, but, but somebody just said something just in the, in the by. 
and the Lord spoke to me concerning a grace that I've tapped into. You know, I'm, I'm, I've, I'm walking with a doctor. I'm, 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 I'm on a journey with a doctor. And this doctor is really helpful to me and whatever. But this year, I went through certain transitions, which I believe was right. But in this discussion, I just felt a conviction. I must go back to this doctor and engage with the things that he, that, that he helped me with. And um, on, on Monday, uh, I, I did this. But the, the immediate result of that was an outcome in a situation and grace. So the thing is, if we tap into grace, if we honor one another, but in order to receive from you, if, in order to receive for what you have in the body, I need to bend. I need to receive. I need to value you. I, you need to be, I need to value you more than what I am so that the grace on you, because I always say grace flows with gravity, so that I can receive from you. So if I have all the answers and all the excuses, I can't receive. My mouth is too busy. But if I shut up, be quiet, and listen, then I can receive. Then I can take in what the Lord has for me. So fortunately, we plucked into a place where there are many graces. There are many graces outside as well, the house. But there are many graces in the house. And so we must, we must rid ourselves from this legalistic relationships. And come into the realness and the, the trueness and the, the, the seriousness and the, 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 the transparency of real relationships where grace can flow. And you know, some may walk in a father-son relationship and it's limited and in your life and it's okay. Some may walk in a more intense father and son relationship. We mustn't judge one another. There's some people that doesn't walk in that and they're also still welcome. Especially They are especially welcome here. Um, it's, 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 it's not a legalistic thing. It's not a thing, if you don't walk in this, then you are not part. You are actually more than welcome if you don't see it because no person will say no to something which will benefit you. So in time, you may sit here and God may just one day through a simple scripture that Sibu sees where we read here in front, by welcoming everybody, something drops in your heart and it just changes your mind. It changes your heart. The first summit that I went to, Pastor Stephen from Suteria, he, he did the, uh, the offer word. And I sat there at the back. You know, those days before I knew Pastor Ben, I was used to sit at the back at pastor's meetings. <laughs> I always thought, I give my life to ministry, but because I'm not a pastor, I sit at the back. So I was sitting there at the back. Nobody knew about me. And Pastor Stephen was bringing the offer word. And I tell you, he spoke right into, I just walked in, he, he spoke, I, I didn't connect to Dr. Ben, nothing of that happened. I was, I mean, I was trying to digest set man, which I got, somebody gave me a CD, and it was, that was tough, eh? that was, I knew I'm going to have a lot of, a lot of paksla if I take this CD and give it to other people. I was just sitting there at the back, and Pastor Stephen started speaking about how God's provision and he was, and I mean, he was totally on a page where he was totally different page where I was. But he said two or three things which dropped into my spirit. And before I even met Dr. Ben, it created wealth that was released in our lives. A expectation, he dropped that. So you, you walk in here, Lida is bringing the offer word or the breaking of bread word. By the way, we can break as often as possible. It's a grace, the breaking of bread. And she can bring this word, and it drops into your spirit, and it graces you. Yeah, that's just a new term. It graces you, and it propels you, and it activates you. And all of a sudden, this thing that you hoped for, this house you want to buy, or this new business venture, all of a sudden is empowered. And all of a sudden, you can do it, and you think to yourself, why is this happening? In April, we went to the Easter conference. And uh, we were there at the Easter conference, we were in Plet, and it was, for me, it was a tough weekend, because Dr. Ben was there, Prophet Sean was there, and you know, these conferences, you need to perform. I mean, the place needs to be, it's, it's a lot of responsibility, fortunately, we have a team. And, and, and over the weekend, I started feeling sick, and I knew God was speaking to me about coffee. And I th thought in my wildest dreams, but I was, I was I'm a heavy coffee -er. So I drink strong coffee. And, and the Lord was speaking. I thought in my wildest dreams, I can't cut coffee now, but it was, it was attacking my, my, my intestines. Um, 
uh, it wasn't attacking the, my, uh, there was a problem, but it's because of certain other reasons as well. And I, and I just thought to myself, yeah, I, I, I don't know, but yes, I will need to, uh, the, the, I, 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 I see me cons, I don't see any way out of this. And I went through the weekend, and the weekend was very enjoyable and everything. And after the weekend, by the Thursday, I just felt bad for a day or so. I thought, but I haven't drank any coffee. So you understand, no, I'm not saying you mustn't drink coffee. Please, it's the last thing I'm saying. The fact is, it's grace. You tap into sometimes, you tap, you come here, and you've been battling with something you don't get right with your computer programming or a deal you don't get right or the government and government blocking you. And you're trying so hard. It's late in the early in the morning, late at night, and you think that will benefit you. But what you needed is grace. And you tap into that grace, and all of a sudden you get the thing right. All of a sudden the things just work for you. It's like King Saul. He was looking for his donkeys, got his kingship, and found and his donkeys came by itself. So many of our donkeys will come back to us if we just focus on the kingdom. So so that thing that we've been, especially if we are isolated. Isolation is very dangerous. It's a very, 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 we don't, you, because you lose track of what is done elsewhere. And this is what I enjoyed with this leaders breakaway last weekend. I actually was just revived on what is in Pastor Cooney's life, what is in Pastor Charles, Pastor Logan's life. The wives, they even carry grace. And all of them, they, they, they have something to give. Everybody in the body, what every, what leader started with, what every joint supply. And we eat of that joint, of that supply rather. And we are built up and we are strengthened. And, and this morning I want to say to you, I can't tell you how many times I've tried hard to achieve something. And when I connected it with grace or just relaxed, and all of a sudden I get the victory. We, mustn't use, we can't use the word breakthrough anymore. We use the word victory. Then I get the victory over that thing, that thing falls in place. And all of a sudden, what was difficult two or three, four, five years ago, and I've been struggling with this thing, I've now relaxed, and I can just gently walk into this. And it, it's, that's what it means. He sets a table before me uh, in, in the presence of my enemy. My enemy is that thing you can't get right, that thing you can't overcome, that thing that's been battling all your life with. All of a sudden, oh, thank you, Lord, you've done it. And I can't, can't take any glory. Now, John 10, verse 30, and I and the Father are one. Remember, we speak on the wineskin, the new wines, the wineskin of the New Testament church. Fathers and sons forms the basis and foundation of oneness. I want to say again, fathers and sons forms the basis of oneness. John 17, 9 to 11, I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. Can I say to you this morning, when I speak about the spirit of community, you know how we're going to realize when the spirit of community is when I feel you belong to me and I belong to you. We suddenly feel, but we, want, we, uh, we belong to one another. We are part of one another. If we feel disjointed, if we feel isolated, or if we feel inferior, if we feel we don't fit in, that thing has not happened yet. There's a, there's a belonging that must come. It's not mechanical. It's not here and there. It's a oneness. That's the oneness of the body. That doesn't matter what your qualification is. Everybody in the body, what every joint supply. That value of every person. It's not like animal farm. Some are more important than others. We're all equal, but some are more equal than others. No, we all, one, one body. We have different functions, but one body, one, one, one. That's the strength of the church. Now, if Jesus said, I am my father's and my father's is mine, and you are, we are his, then how much more are we part of one another? All mine are yours and yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. You see, that's where glorification takes place, is in you are mine and I'm yours then glorification can take place of Christ. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them, keep them in your name. So he keeps us by his name, his nature, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. So Jesus' prayer right before his crucifixion is, Lord, 
Let them be one as you and I are one. Lord, let them be part of me and I'm part of them. And we must, you must get this experience of me. You must think I am, I am part of Tinas and Tinas is part of me. We belong to each other. Our children, our, our, everything belongs to one another. That's that community that we saw that in, 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 in Acts. They didn't say that anything belongs to them. And this is the spirit of community that brings this. We belong to each other. We are part of each other. We give our hearts to the Lord, but also to one another. You give your heart to the Lord. Lord, come into my heart. Lord, I give you my heart. Have you given your heart to Paben? Blasphemous. This is what it requires. We need to give our hearts to one another. I've given my heart to my wife. I've given my heart to my children. Uh, it's easy to sacrifice for them. I'll even easily give my life for them. I sacrifice. I um, submit. I, so why not in the church? See, that's the, the level of relations that the Lord wants us to go in. You won't be able to stay away from church. We will not need to tell you you must come to church if you have that dynamic and exciting form of relationship at church. I belong to them, and they belong to me, and I can, we can eat and live from each other's graces. My weakness is protected at the table. My lameness is protected at the table. I'm enabled. I'm not judged. All right, so we give our hearts to the Lord, but also to one another. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Well, Jesus is after a day to pray, Lord, I'm one with you and you in me. But why can't we pray the same? And we, you see, it's easy to love the Lord. It's easy to worship the Lord. It's easy to believe the Lord. But do we love one another? Do we believe one another? Do we belong to one another? Because this is a requirement. Otherwise, we can't really be his disciple. If, if we do not love our brother, which we see, who we see, how can we love God who we haven't seen? If you want to love God, love your brother. God's sitting right next to you and me. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. He says perfectly one. We need to be perfectly one. It's not a half one or maybe one. We are perfectly one. So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. So that the world must know that God loved us and God sent Jesus. They will see it by the love that we have for one another. The oneness that they will find. Now, you know, we've, we've, we've received spiritual fathers. And I'm coming in for a landing. We, we have received spiritual fathers. But let's say your father has given you anything, everything. He's poured his life out on you. You now a mature son. You've, you've received all that you could have received from your father. Why, do you still need your spiritual father? Or have you outrun a spiritual father? And I'm going to come to the essence of why we need spiritual fathers. The most important thing what we need from a spiritual father is not what we believe it is. You know, it's easy to submit to a father. People are very prideful. They all want to submit to the smart father. But they don't want to submit about this pastor with an old car coming, working hard there in Mamelodi East, working daily. Nobody wants to submit to him because he's not rich. But actually, we're missing the point. They said, they said, they, the, the reason why I need a father is I need somebody that I can love. I need somebody. Dr. Ben always says, your mon- I don't need your money. Your money needs me. We need somebody that you can love. You need somebody who you can serve. We need somebody who can, we can give to. We need somebody that we can obey. We need so- somebody that we can sacrifice to. Remember, we sons. Sons inherit. You need, in part, of, in part of your ingredients, you need this in your life. So it's not about what he can give to me, but what my, des- what my needs spiritually are. I need to serve somebody. I need to love somebody. I need to honor somebody. I need to learn honor, and therefore I need the spiritual father. So this whole thing of the spiritual fathers, these big main mentalities, is not necessary. Spiritual fathers is I need him because I need somebody to love. 
So you can never outgrow the point of having a spiritual father. You, need, you, you understand this from, from what I need. I need to give to somebody. Dr. Willemin gave a testimony. He said, whenever he received his monthly th- salary, when he was here, he, when he, he received his monthly salary, he went to his father and submitted it to his father. And his father then blessed it, and he then applied it, and he gave some to his parents. And he said when he fa- his father passed away, he got so poor that his children he didn't even have nappies. This is, he gave this testimony when he was here. He said, they didn't have nappies. He said, they were so poor, and it was like everything was bronze around them. And one day he said, Lord, but what has happened to me? He said, since your father has died, you have stopped serving me, giving to me. You have stopped that because his father passed away. So then the Lord spoke to him, and he started giving that to his mother, and immediately the flow was there again. So I say, we need that vessel, that deposit account, that place, that person to serve. We need to serve him with our lives, with our goods, with everything. We need to make this, put the kingdom first by putting a person first. I need that. If I don't do this, I'll become poor, poor in spirit, poor in finances, poor in life, poor in experience, poor in in everything, in ministry. If I don't have a place where I can serve, where I can give, where I can honor, where I can, where I can bless. You understand? So this is the importance of a spiritual father. This is why we need a house. This is why we need the father, son, wineskin. We can learn a lot from our fathers, but our greater need is to love them. Love includes sacrifice, giving, listed, uh, listened to, and honor. The essence is love and relationships. For me, I don't worry about all these big things that the world can give. The world do those things. I want the kingdom. I want quality life. I want quality life to me is quality relationships. I don't want tension in the relationships. Those are the things that really matters. It's quality relationships. We must get beyond the rule book of sonship and grow into the very essence and heart of it. You know your first fruit that you give. It must a, it, yes, it could be it's good, it's 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 good that you do it mechanically. But why why not change the whole thing and let it flow from the heart? Flow from the being, flow from the innermost, flow from here. Like, uh, the, yeah, the, like Mary, Mary that broke the, the ointment on Jesus' feet. We can tithe or give first fruits because we have, we have to. Or we can do these offers because we love. Really from a heart that loves. Not because I have to, but I really love and I'm excited to give this, to make this sacrifice. Did you know that love can increase? Philippians 1.9 says, I, my prayer that your love may abound more and more. So we grow in love. Maturity and love is, are equals. You, as you grow in love, you grow in maturity. So we can grow in love. All of us can grow. We as a church can grow much in love. We mustn't do everything and then misses it all. In 1 Corinthians 13, by the way, is not for the weddings only. It's nice to read it at the wedding. It's actually the credo of the church. This, I want to say it again. 1 Corinthians 13 is the credo of the church. The world knows how to make money. You, you'll never beat. None of us that sits here will beat. What's the other song about the Pretoria Geboris? Elon Musk. You won't beat Elon Musk. He made more money probably than all of us will make in our lives. You, you will probably lose a lot of that again by the way he's going on. But okay, that aside, the fact is that is not what makes you a kingdom person. Jesus hung on the cross and he could call 12,000 angels, warring angels to release him. He didn't do it. So our smartness does not qualify us to be kingdom citizens. Our love does. That's different what the world has. Our answers, that's different to what the world has. Not our smartness, not our riches. All those things are good and great and God's giving it to us. I'm not denying that for one, se- one moment. Our success will be there A man of God will have great success in his life. Somebody said to me the other day, he can just feel, a child said this to me, he feels his success. (laughs) He can see his success. He feels his success. One of my children said it. So the atmosphere, I think, was right at home. Um, Inheritance versus gifts. Listen to this scripture, and I'm finishing. Genesis 25, 5. And Abram gave all that he had to Isaac, but Abram gave gifts to the sons. 
of the concubines which Abram had. And while he was still living, he sent them eastward, away from Isaac, his son, to the country of the east. So only Isaac, only the son can inherit. Dr. Ben said it the other day. You know, people leave you. They walk away from you. You've been bringing the word in their lives. And it all of a sudden goes well. As he says, they're driving a Mercedes Benz. <laughs> That's the 80s vision, version of it goes very well with them. A Mercedes Benz and not a Mini. And then, and then, but he says, but they've walked away from inheritance. So you may have, like Isa, may have a lot of gifts in your life. It goes well with you. Yes, you're very rich, but you do not carry the divine seed. That's inheritance. Luke 15, 11. This is the youngest brother of the prodigal. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of my property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. I've seen this in the world. I've seen exactly this. So in this young son, you see entitlement. You see demands. He did not ask, but said to his father. He asked for the share which he is entitled to, which his father worked for. <laughs> He takes the gifts and walks away from inheritance. He is not part of the, listen here, the kingdom econom economy anymore. The house, the father, the family, the business, the production machine is still carrying on. But the son is not part of it anymore. He took his inheritance. He took his, his gifts. His greatest loss is his father. His greatest loss is his father. A father is a progenitor. He carries the seed. Let's look at his older brother, and then I finish. Luke, Luke, then I will be finished. Luke 15, verse 25. Now his oldest son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house. So this is just speaking to us. The one son, he said, I'm leaving. Sorry, I'm offended. Blah, blah, blah. I've got other plans. I'm going to make, I'm going to use the money. I'm going to blow it, whatever. The other, other son sits in the house, but he is as disconnected from the father as his younger brother just in a more religious way. Now his oldest son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he, so that offended him immediately. And he, he called one of the servants. So he's not calling the father. He's not going in. He's not speaking to the father. He gets his information via a very reliable source, a servant. Um, uh, he, he called one of the servants. He says, um, asked, he asked, what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed a fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry, the brother returned, and refused to go in. So he's angry, so he isolates, refused to go in. His father came out and retreated him. So now his father must come out of the house. The father wait, waited outside of the house for the son that was pro the prodigal. But now he must go outside of the house to the older brother. He says, and now look at self-righteousness. And we must so be so careful that we sit in the church pews and not be righteously, and I'm speaking to all of us, I'm speaking to myself. We are, could be so righteous in our own eyes. We are equally lost. I refuse to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you. So self-righteousness. I've never disobeyed your commands. This is quite something. He obeyed all the commands. Yet you never gave me a, a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. So you see this, my, I, me, and myself, my little friends, our little group, our little clique. You never gave me a goat. So he so, he, he so misses it. But when the son of yours came, he doesn't call him his brother. He called him your son. <laughs> came. Who has devoured your property with prostitutes? You killed a fattened calf for him. So you, you give him the fattened calf. You don't even give me a little goat. You see his mindset. He's a totally wrong mindset. So he said in the church, in the presence of the father all the time, but with the wrong mindset. He devoured your um, son, uh, his calf for, me, for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. So you're stupid. You could have for a long time ago slaughtered your own, your own fattened calf. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this young brother was dead and he's alive. He was lost and he's found. This son has anger. He refused to go in. He is outside. He's just a different motiva motivation, but he's still outside. 
He only thinks about his friends, not his brothers, not the servants, not the father. Only his friends. He calls his brother the son, not my brother. So we can call each other brother. But do we le- really love the brother sitting next to me? That's the big question today. You know, it, it could, uh, when the father is gone, what is the brothers? How do they relate to one another? Do they really love one another? Do they walk together? Do they encourage one another? Keep break, so any keep record of his brother's wrong, of his brother's wrongs. I pray that this wine skin will be authentic in our house, that we will walk in authentic, and this is everybody's personal, uh, personal, and we're all in a journey as far as these things are concerned. But this is personal responsibility. It's not, it's not on fathers and sons are not on how successful will I be. It is about the church the community, the love, the relationships. Amen.